was a Bitcoin. Yeah. is up bitcoiners and what is up freaks for those of you who are watching this on youtube i'm wearing my honorary tftc t-shirt y'all are gonna really love this podcast i sat down with diego the co-founder of the rsk sidechain and blockchain as well as uh iov labs which is building on top of rsk and uh our man bruno who is the cto of the defiant wallet which is an rsk enabled wallet that is a cross-platform wallet so we've had one of these on the show before but really this is a wallet that is bitcoin it's rsk it's ethereum and they're about to bring lightning and the whole point is to make it really easy to interoperate with all of that and they are focused on making it super user friendly especially in spanish but as well as english and I think that this was a great podcast. We focused in on what is happening on the ground with Bitcoin in Latin America and Spanish speaking America and talk about what's happening in El Salvador. Diego dropped a ton of knowledge bombs. And it was really interesting to hear from Bruno talk about, uh, you know, kind of being a Ethereum focused project and then pivoting and incorporating a lot of the Bitcoin stack and focusing on on interoperability and and Bitcoin. So it's very interesting to just see how this ecosystem is all playing together. And I think you all are going to get a lot from this interview. So without further ado, let's just jump into this interview. Peace. <laughs> Bitcoiners, welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I am sitting here with two builders once again in the Bitcoin space, two builders who are focused on Latin America and countries where uh, they may not be privileged with you know, some of the US and uh, European financial infrastructure. Uh, these are countries where uh, we are seeing Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies really start to take hold uh, and start to serve a lot of real people who just need money that works. Um, I'm sitting across from Diego, uh, of course, of RSK, a repeat guest on the show, and Bruno of the Defiant Wallet, a uh, first-time guest. But we are really excited to uh, just sit down and get a 2021 fall update on what is happening on the ground with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency adoption in Latin America. Uh, without further ado, let's just jump to the, the panelists. Diego, let's go to you. How are you doing? What is new with RSK? Everyone here is really getting excited about a lot of the different projects being built on RSK. So uh, what is new with RSK and, and, and how are things going on your end? I think a lot of things are, are happening in RSK at the moment, like, um, you know, the the, the total value lock in, in RSK from Bitcoin keeps growing. It's now over 2000, like around almost 2,100 Bitcoins. Uh, you know, active users keep growing uh, like week by week. So it's like, and in a, in a big part, I think it's due to, to what the community, to the RSK ecosystem is doing in, in El Salvador. It's like, um, there's some of, some of the members of the RSK ecosystem, uh, people from crypto market that are on the ground and they are doing a big push in terms of educating people to, to manage uh, their assets in a non-custodial way as an alternative to the system that the, the government provided. And, and they are doing a big educational uh, task and, and work. So that's on one side, then new protocols have, have been launched like uh, Babelfish that uh, creates a meta stable asset. Um, that's very interesting because then the user can, can use this meta stable asset and get in and out of that system through the existing stable assets in RSK. Uh, so it abstracts from the complexities of understanding where are the different risk models of each stable asset within uh, within um, RSK? Um, and there are some things that are on the way, like um, new protocols that will 
emulate or when we use emulate the experience of uh, using a fintech or a neobank for payments but on non-custodial environments no mm -hmm. and and bruno can share about that because we are working together on integrating these new protocols uh, basically the Rift payment suite uh, it's uh, it, it's comprised of payment channels similar to Lightning in Bitcoin, but on top of RSK. Also, there are, there is some work being done in terms of creating interoperability between Lightning and RSK, so people can send Bitcoins on Lightning and get uh, stable assets on RSK. That will be very powerful for El Salvador, where people maybe don't want to stay exposed to the volatility of Bitcoin in the short term, so they can move very fast and very cheap into stable assets and back. Um, then you have payment aggregation, that we have some payment aggregation systems or rollups like they are calling Ethereum, um, running on RSK already. And that's also another breakthrough. And with that, potentially we can have 500 transactions per second, but also lower transactional costs by one order of magnitude or, or even more in the future. And when you combine that with, for example, uh, Rift Relaying, where people can pay the fees of the network with the token they are transacting without having to have uh, access to RBTC initially, and somebody will pay the network in RBTC, in Bitcoins on RSK, that also like abstract complexity from the end user. So I think it's very interesting because when you put all this together, you can keep the non-custodial nature that we, I mean, the ethos of Bitcoin, but also provide the experience, the user experience of a fintech or a neobank. Uh, so I think that will be a breakthrough. It's like, um, you know, the the partners in the ecosystems like like uh, Defiant are putting these pieces together and still we don't have like the full experience, but I think when people can experience all these integrated, I think there was, there would be and a how moment for many people in, in the space. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, a lot to unpack there, Diego. Yeah. And I think, you know, you touched on several things that we're going to talk about. One, you touched on what's happening in El Salvador and, uh, you know, alternatives and education uh, alternative to what the government is pushing there. Uh, you also talked about stable assets and how important that is. Um, in conjunction with uh, BTC. So uh, I know that, uh, you know, Bruno and, and several other folks, you know, are trying to help people get access to, um, you know, dollar denominated um, value, uh, you know, in a non-custodial way that doesn't have trust. Bruno, let's move over to you. And, and I'm excited to learn more about what you're building and learn more about Defiant. Yeah, cool. So I'm one of the, of the co-founders uh, well, that started up Defiant. And so we started the project in late uh, 2019. And uh, at that point, we were just a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace focused on our, our value was joining buyers and sellers, um, mostly of uh, stable assets. So mostly at that time, it was uh, DAI or maybe USDT, uh, as I can recall. Uh, it was even before uh, Dollar and Chain, for instance, one of the biggest um, stable assets in, in the RSK ecosystem was born. And so um, at, by that time, we uh, defined what's needed on the wallet. But luckily, we got to, to know and got to, to work alongside with, with RSK, with the team leaded by, by Diego. We, and uh, together with them, we, we started to, to develop Defined as a, as a wallet, uh, besides having the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. And we, we started like, learning um, about the RSK ecosystem, their projects, their view, their, uh, their, their, their goals they, they have, and their vision really, really, um, we, we started to, to really like it. And so from that point on, we started working really near, close to them. And uh, then we uh, defined, developed into a, a full-fledged wallet, not only of RSK, but also for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And 
So yeah, we're trying to integrate most of the, the solutions that the Ito was, was telling you about. We're really eager to, to, to offer the, the end user these solutions because we think that um, we're a really important um, part of the, the, the chain for, for that matters because maybe RSK can, can create beautiful solutions, really sophisticated technical solutions, but if we don't give the user a really uh, clean, comfortable and uh, easy to use um, product, wallet in this case, uh, those solutions that RSK creates won't uh, really um, fulfill their, their ends, you know? So, well, with that in mind, we try to create uh, every day a wallet that's really appealing for the user and by which we can uh, offer them these non-custodial uh, decentralized solutions that are being created um, in our SK ecosystem and also in other, in other he finds, uh, it's a, of course, a self-custodial wallet. And we've got, we've got, quite some interesting uh, milestones ahead. Um, for instance, um, during next month, we'll be releasing a new version uh, with which you'll be able to use not only RSK and um, Ethereum, but also any other EVM blockchain, which is really interesting because we're seeing um, we're seeing how, how the different EVMs and different blockchains are being, um, are being connected among them. We're seeing how bridges, uh, as the Ito was telling you, are being born. And we're also really, really excited about these solutions that, that the Ito was telling you about um, that connect um, layer two solutions in RSK, for instance, with uh, Lightning Network, as an example. Okay, so Bruno, a lot to unpack there. Uh, again, I think that there's two main themes. One is, you know, the RSK ecosystem is really growing to the point that um, it attracted you to start working on it from, you know, Ethereum and other kind of crypto assets. Uh, so I think that is uh, very interesting. And the other, and I think this is pertinent to our audience because our this is Bitcoin Magazine, our audience for the most part, they could be characterized as Bitcoin maximalists. Uh, you know, maybe they see Bitcoin as the ultimate money, uh, and they may or may not acknowledge where stable coins kind of fit into that and why. That's something that's uh, was a focus of your initial product and probably still a focus here. And then, I mean, I guess lastly, it's just the interoperability and why that's important. But I guess let's first dive into, I guess, RSK. A lot of that had to do with, you know, the availability of stable coins there. I'm kind of curious, like, why are stable coins so important, right? In terms of uh, the market that you're trying to serve, but in general, because I think a lot of Bitcoiners have this fantasy that, hey, you know, Bitcoin's the perfect money but the, it may not, um, you know, it, in terms of like today, it may not be the most useful thing for people who are trying to live in, in a dollar denominated world, right? Because the world is still do dollar denominated. So I guess curious your thoughts there. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I'm sure that the leader also has some, uh, some strong and interesting opinions on, the, on this matter. And I'd say that two different things come to my mind regarding that aspect. So the first one is why stable coins? And here probably um, people that don't live, uh, that don't live uh, every day in a country where inflation is a really, really important issue, don't get to grasp the, the importance of this matter. Because like, you know, here, for instance, in Argentina, it happens that both uh, RSK was originally born in, in Argentina and also ourselves. And we, we perfectly know what it is to, to go, not being really, really uh, sure of the price of things, you know, in our native uh, currency. So uh, for that matter, stable coins are, are perfect because you you don't have inflation well then you have to see if the 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 issue the the asset to which they're pegged has inflation as it may be in the case of the in the case of the dollar the us dollar but at least it has co as compared to our uh, local currency much less inflation and also that's one one important matter 
And the second one uh, regarding why other types of, of uh, coins and not only Bitcoin, maybe uh, when talking only about layer one Bitcoin and not Lightning Network, mainly the, the transaction fees are one important uh, matter because as we, we, we um, like to envision uh, crypto not only being used for large amounts of large payments, but for everyday payments that, and we like to, to imagine our users being able to pay their for their everyday life for everything uh, in whatever crypto we may discuss then which crypto but with that with that in mind um if you have um, bitcoin there one bitcoin fees in the order of some dollars it's not feasible you know so those are the two two main reasons um why why others other coins and mostly stable coins come into the scene <laughs> Bitcoiners, I want to tell you about our newest sponsor. This show is brought to you by Ledin.io. I have been super, super impressed with the guys over at Ledin. I've actually known the co-founders, Adam and Mauricio, for a very long time. I've had the pleasure to watch them build Ledin up from a tiny, tiny startup to now a super impressive institutional grade Bitcoin and crypto lender. Y'all, I'm so impressed with these guys. They are offering some of the best rates out there. I don't think anyone even comes close to touching them. You can get 6.1% APY on your first two Bitcoin that you deposit into lead and interest accounts, and you can get 8.5% US on USDC deposits. I mean, I know all the competitors. They're not even close. If you're going to put your crypto and your Bitcoin into an interest account, Ledin is by far the best. And on top of that, like I said, these guys are hardcore Bitcoiners and they know the products and the services that Bitcoiners want and appreciate. They come up with B2X. It allows you to put your Bitcoin in, they leverage it up, and you can, with one click of the mouse, get twice the exposure to Bitcoin. So if you're super bullish, Ledin has you covered with a super, super easy way to get leverage with B2X. And then on top of that, they know that Bitcoiners care about your reserves. They know that Bitcoiners don't like under-reserved and not full-reserved financial institutions. So they are pushing the frontier in transparency in the digital asset lending space. And they are the first digital asset lender to do a full proof of reserves and proof of attestation through a Mariano LLC, a public accounting firm. So the letting guys, they know what Bitcoin is like. They are legit. I encourage you guys to check them out. Do your own research and go to ledin.io. That is L E D N.io and learn more. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you about the deep dive. The deep dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium market intelligence newsletter. This is a no fluff, hard hitting, incredible newsletter going deep into the market, helping you understand what's happening with derivatives what's happening on chain, what's happening in macro, what's happening with the narrative, and what's happening with the tech. My man Dylan McClare is an absolute savant. He is making his name known in the Bitcoin community, getting shout outs left and right, getting on podcasts left and right, and him and his team are bringing you everything that you need to know about Bitcoin. You don't even have to be on Bitcoin Twitter. You can ignore every other newsletter. This is the newsletter to rule them all. Go over to members.com. BitcoinMagazine.com. Sign up today. And if you use promo code MACRO, you get a full month for free. You have nothing to lose. What are you waiting for? Sign up. See the incredible work that Dylan and his team are putting out. And if you don't like it, just unsubscribe. You don't pay a dime. But if you do, you know, it's going to be well worth the sats in investment in understanding Bitcoin and gaining the confidence to continue to invest in Bitcoin and making the right moves around Bitcoin. And it's going to be well worth every single Satoshi. Uh, again, can't recommend it enough. That is members.bitcoinmagazine.com, promo code macro. Do it today. Diego, I want to kind of pivot to you, right? So um, obviously you're building the RSK ecosystem in order to enable a lot of, you know, the crypto native uh, functionality that it's been difficult to build onto Bitcoin. What are you seeing from your users, especially users um, kind of in uh, El Salvador and Latin America that are, you know, 
kind of going firsthand or, you know, uh, head first into uh, living on in, in some sort of a crypto enabled way. What are you seeing, you know, their needs and uh, and, you know, where is the role of stable coins versus Bitcoin versus other things? Well, you know, when when we started RSK, we we ext- we started RSK exactly to with the purpose of creating the environment where you could have a P2P monetary system backed by Bitcoin, where stable assets could be issued without counterparty risk, without resorting to central authorities. And, you know, if if you think about that, the, the first movers in the stablecoin movement, USDT or then USDC, they were all backed by the actual asset they, they are representing and, and they have custodial, you know, they have custodial intermediaries. No? So, so basically you, you are not removing counterparty risk. You are removing volatility, of course, but you still have counterparty risk. And, and when we started creating RSK, the first use case, because we, I was going to the slums and seeing the realities of people who live day by day, week by week, month by month and then i realized bitcoin was not a fit for somebody that lives in you know day by day because basically you cannot be exposed to the volatility and that i would say applies to 80 percent of the population it's like only 20 percent of the population can save money for a period of two or three years so so you can wait for bitcoin to appreciate or take the next cycle no to to jump into the next cycle um so with exception of places, I don't know, like Venezuela, where volatility is so high in the local economy, where Bitcoin is stable, <laughs> in the rest of Latin America, you needed something to bridge the volatility gap between the, you know, the local currency and Bitcoin. And, and that was the original model. It's like how we can create stable assets, but we don't want to do that in, in a custodial way or with intermediaries, because then we, we go back to, to the to the model that we are trying to disrupt so you know the idea was initially to go back to kind of a four knocks where instead of having gold you know as collateral you would have bitcoin and and create a protocol and the original ideas we were thinking of in rsk were similar to what maker dao created and we acknowledged back then that they had certain problems like you know that the collateral was not non-fungible, so each collateral uh, uh, contract was independent. So you needed market makers. So th- th- that design, and then later on, when the money on chain team came on board and they they wanted to implement this idea, we had a lot of discussions where I shared my original models for creating a peer-to-peer monetary system. And, and thanks to those discussions, they came out with a much better design, in my opinion, because it's a design where all the Bitcoins in collateral back in the stable assets are fungible. So, so you can actually redeem the stable assets again the pro- against the protocol without the need of a market maker or, or a secondary market. So, so it's like really you're removing, you have a stable assets uh, when you use money, money on chain, you have a stable assets that have platform risk or underlying asset risk, but they don't have counterparty risk. So, so that's like the first element is like, as what we want is to have a purely peer to peer financial system. We need to have non-custodial wallets like Defiant. We need to have a peer to peer monetary system. And then we need to have, uh, you know, financial services that also run in a peer to peer where I'm lending to another user. And that's what is going on with the Defi movement and you know it started in ethereum and, and now it's developing very well in the in the rsk ecosystem so we are you know slowly but steady getting to the point of achieving that original vision of creating a truly peer-to-peer financial system secured by bitcoin no because that's the other key element that rsk rootstock mm-hmm. brings to the table is like yep. we did all this using the bitcoin network as a security network and with Bitcoin as the underlying asset of all this. So that's something very unique of Rootstock that is like every transaction in Rootstock incentivizes the Bitcoin miner. So by Rootstock growing, it's making Bitcoin stronger. And that full alignment of incentives between the two networks create that now we can serve, we have a financial service, a system that can 
serve any human being, regardless if they can save for two, three years or they live day by day, and everything is running in, in you know, secured by the Bitcoin network and incentivizing the Bitcoin miners. And that is something that no other sidechain has created, like that full alignment of incentives. So if you are a Bitcoiner, you want RSK, you want Rootstock to be successful because you know then Bitcoin will be more sustainable, it will be stronger. So there's full alignment. Having said that, what are the other challenges? Because now that's a reality. We have lending, we have a peer-to-peer -peer monetary system, we have non-custodial wallets that are integrating all this and making it easy to use for the end user. And now I would say the, the more, the biggest challenges that are already technically solved but need to be deployed uh, or, or offered to the end user are scalability, and ease of use. And, and those are the protocols that are being integrated. No, it's like scalability and, and operational cost. No, it's like how we lower transactional costs yep. in our okay, a transaction cost. If you do it on chain, 20 cents USD for a token transaction and five cents USD for a, for a Bitcoin transaction. So how we lower that to a, to a point where it's not relevant for the user. It's like, and, and basically you need to take that down to under a cent or under two cents. And then any human being can use the transaction payment system like that. So that's when payment aggregation and all these other services I was mentioning in, in the beginning of our talk come into play and, and you know, scale blockchains to have hundreds of transactions per second and eventually thousands of transactions per second and lower the transactional cost to a fraction of a cent. So they, may, they make this open financial system available to any human being uh, in the world. And in Latin America, that's essential because 50% of our population is excluded from the traditional financial system because of economical reasons and because they don't have a collateral and they sometimes they don't have a formal identity. And all those things are the missing pieces that we are trying to put together. Um, that's, you know, in El Salvador, that's a very good example now that everybody's talking about that. 70% of the population don't have access to financial services or smartphones. So that's, you know, the reality of most of Latin America. No? So, so those are the real challenges is how we make this economically viable to any human being in the world. No? So, yeah, I mean, I agree that scalability is definitely going to be a challenge. Um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what, you know, both of your takes on what's currently happening in El Salvador. I want to go to Bruno because uh, you're new to the show and you haven't talked about El Salvador before, but what's your digestion of what's happening there, especially from the perspective of you're trying to build a usable, easy um, wallet that will help people onboard? I'm just kind of curious your take. I think that regardless of our own position in the, in the ecosystem, uh, what's happening currently in El Salvador, it's, uh, it's a really interesting experiment, um, like globally. Uh, that involve uh, that implies, and it will have consequences on a social level and on a political level, on a global economic level. Uh, I think it's just the first of uh, many many cases similar to that to this one that will that we'll see. And regarding it in particular, we as a as a team, me and my team, we're uh, like. We're waiting to see what, what happens there. There's a lot of fuss uh, uh, around El Salvador. We, I mean, for sure, we will be there for the La, La Vitconf, which will be held there in, in a couple of, well, almost a couple of weeks now. And, um, and but we, we haven't like really, really uh, gone there to, to try to, 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 sell let's say our, our product or anything because like there's a we see that there's a lot of noise and uh, we've been uh hearing from people that, that is uh, actually there uh physically actually there and that there's a lot of it, it has of course its political um uh side you know so of course some people will be against it because of uh, from those, its its own very uh, way the way it was it was uh, brought to the table and so some people on the other hand will be for it 
because they they have some sympathy for the government and one one side that we don't really enjoy is this that the bitcoin is being uh, used for political uh, for political um need for political means you know i mean like it, it wasn't like for sure it wasn't the the in the very the very um the very intention in its beginning but now i mean it's like kind of related to politics you know so we'll see what happens there i think that it's really really interesting of course we we will we will be there present as a non custodial wallet a really easy to use non custodial wallet which will have um lightning network integrated and we'll be there I think that there there are many things to be to be learned from El Salvador, and but but it's it's good in, in general terms, you know. Bruno, what's your take on the educational situation? Obviously, it's become political. We see the no all Bitcoin, and it's all about you know opposing Bukele for the most part. You know, the majority of people are like, oh, you know, maybe we don't like the technology. I don't really know this is about the totalitarian nature of Bukele. What what do you think of like? the state of education because it seems as though the government has announced this thing they released the atms in the app and they really haven't done much communication outside of that well of course for, for sure the educational side has to has to be has to be there you know because it, it has to be there uh together with the technical solutions and uh, the social the social uh lattice you know that's needed for for everyone to be able to to use it. I don't know. That's why I I, I said in the beginning that it was an experiment. Um, I don't think we've had such experiences like this where the there's like kind of an imposition to use such a technology. You know, it it has been ever uh, it has ever been the other way around. It has been brought from the roots up, and so for I think that. Yeah, education doesn't happen from one day to the next one, and that will be one of the weak points of this whole uh, experiment. And education, mostly, as I think that the, the three of us here could could be could agree that um, people people has always uh, started using Bitcoin or whatever crypto because they have been moved. To it, I mean, because they have wanted to 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 do it, not the other way around. So, and that helps education. I mean, if you if you want to do something, you feel like it, you will educate yourself as much as you need in order to feel sure uh, to to use that that solution, the technology, or whatever. And so, I think yeah, it will be a a weak point. Let's hope it helps, and and because uh, it's something, it's a technology that it's. Is uh, there are plenty of projects trying to to wrap it and put it more comfortable and more easy to use for the end user. So I think that it's not as hard as it may have been five six years ago. So I want to go back to Diego. I mean, Diego, you're you're obviously on the grounds uh, with a strong effort in El Salvador. What's your assessment of what has happened since the Bitcoin law got passed officially? lack of education from the government etc i think because of the time frame that were that was set uh it was impossible to educate anybody because everything was pushed and, and decided like at a f very fast pace and when you understand how politics work i think that was on purpose because the more time you you let the um, the process develop, the the more you will have operations against you, political operations, and, and you have all these like uh, you know uh, parades and, and and news like you, you know pay news against the process. So, so it's like you can see that you know anything, any controversial thing or or drastic thing like the ones like pushing Bitcoin as a, you know legal tender in a country. Uh, will be used against the opposition uh, to to try to to gain power. So so it's like uh, in that sense, I think from a political perspective, it was a good move to do everything in such a fast pace. Also, that had many implications: not enough time to educate people, and the deployment of a custodial solution. Because what what the government is providing is a custodial solution for everybody, 
and it's a closed system because mostly it's like uh, transactions are free as long as you're operating within the government's application. So that would be from a pure Bitcoin ethos. That's like a, a contra or something we don't like because we we believe in the sovereignty of individuals. We want, but if you if you think you know in a longer term, this is enabling the 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 Bitcoin movement to be validated and to operate on the grassroots and, and, and working towards doing, I mean, filling those gaps. And that's exactly what the Rootstock ecosystem is doing in El Salvador. They are doing meetups where they educate people, where they help them install the wallets, the non-custodial wallets. Um, so I think as long as they, the government enables this to happen and, and you, you can have the non-custodials like more true to the spirit, <laughs> solutions uh, of Bitcoin, no, uh, be be deployed and distributed among the population, and and that can live side to side, side by side with the government system. Then it's a total win for the for our ecosystem and for the decentralization movement, because you have the the government validation that you know Bitcoin is a valid option, uh, and they are not telling you not to use non you know non custodial systems or sovereign systems they are just saying telling okay everybody is forced to to use bit accept bitcoin so we need to provide the means for everybody to accept bitcoin the means we are providing is custodial we don't have the time to to teach you but you can go anywhere else and get a non custodial wallet and learn from the community, so so we can see this as a problem or as an opportunity, you no? Know? And that, and I think what I like of the rootstock because it's the rootstock ecosystem. It's not us. It's not IOE Labs. It's like you know, DeFi and uh, crypto market, big so money on chain, like all the ecosystem is working. And I love to see that. For me, I'm very proud of what is happening. It's like all the rootstock ecosystem is going to the ground. Some of them are physically there. The other ones are supporting, sponsoring the endeavors, sponsoring the meetups, the, the train. And when you combine that with La Bitconf that is coming on November 15th to 20th to El Salvador, and, and we will do like massive educational programs there and, and bring the best, the top speakers of the Bitcoin and decentralization world there. I think we have something that can be very, very meaningful. Like it, it can be like a pivotal uh, moment for, for Bitcoin and crypto. So we, instead of like looking at, you know, the things that are not ideal or not working, we should see at the huge opportunity we have ahead of us. And, and I think the Rootstock ecosystem really understood that and is, I mean, the, these Bitcoin mutants are, <laughs> are, are seizing the opportunity. So, so that's my take on that. And, and you see that it's also, this is also like El Salvador's move is also creating a domino effect in the region because, you know, right after El Salvador mentioned about making Bitcoin legal tender, uh, politicians uh, started like pushing laws in, in Paraguay. And now we have uh, another law being proposed in, in Panama, uh, where they will accept Bitcoin as a legal payment system, even though not in, to the extreme of El Salvador. So I think all these uh, things that are happening, although they don't happen in an ideal model, like we would expect as Bitcoiners, where it's in self-custodial models, are creating a very positive environment for Bitcoin. And, and then, you know, it's up to us, the, the people who has been building the Bitcoin ecosystem and, and the different uh, decentralization solutions uh, to take it in the right direction. But now we have the proper environment to make that happen. It's like, you know, we are not on the edge of the law or in a gray area where we don't know which liabilities we are taking by doing what we are doing. So. I think it's it's huge. It's like uh, you know, because we I was mentioning this in the context that you know many times people are like focusing on the things that are not quite right. You no, know? like saying okay, El Salvador is is doing Bitcoin in a custodial way. It's doing Bitcoin like in a you know it's not taking yeah. time to to educate and and that's like putting the focus on you know on 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 the problems and not on the opportunities. And I think it's like. Okay, the government like took it to a to a certain point that it's like 
providing legal tender to Bitcoin, which is huge, or in the case of Panama, accepting it as a legal payment means or trying to do that same with Paraguay, like, you know, then it's up to us to take that opportunity and, and educate people on, on the value of non-custodial solutions, on the value of being your own bank, uh, you know, and, and, and providing non-custodial solutions to, to, every, to, the, yep. to the people in our region. So, yeah, I think this is a huge opportunity for, for the ecosystem and a pivotal moment. I would say in the crypto industry. So I, I love I love your perspective, and you I think you brought up a lot a lot of fantastic points. One from a political perspective, this was the way to make the law happen, you know, most effectively, right? So if you're purely on the Bitcoin train, this got it done. And then two, you know, they aren't promoting their wallet, they aren't educating people, which is a good and a bad thing, right? It's creating a lot of confusion. But the good thing is it gives an opportunity for non government entities to take that up. And I think that's a fantastic point that a lot of people um, have not considered. Um, I'm kind of again, just to kind of bring it back to to Bruno, like, you know, you mentioned interoperability, I know a lot of people have said that El Salvador would not even remotely work if lightning network wasn't a part of that. Um, and you mentioned, you know, Lightning is coming to the Defiant Wallet as well as Lightning is enabling um, a lot of interoperability directly with RSK and Bitcoin. Uh, can we talk a little bit about Lightning in general, what's happening with Lightning in, in El Salvador and, uh, you know, what that means for integrating into the crypto stacks that you two are working on? Mm, yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, I think that, yeah, for El Salvador, um solutions well lightning network as a technology and wallets that have that have been integrated um are are crucial um or it's um, it's otherwise going and using uh no uh, custodial custodial solutions as Diego was saying which i don't think that goes with uh, our our use of uh how Bitcoin is, is was meant to be to be used, and of how it's the, the most convenient and the most anonymous and um, intelligent and economical way to use it. And so, yeah, I think that um, this this year, well, actually, I'd say that last year it was uh, the first great year for for light, lightning. And this year will be even even more important, and next year also, because as we see more more countries also uh, declaring Bitcoin as legal tender, and as we see more and more users coming on the on the scene, um, solutions that allow you to 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 transact with Bitcoin really fast and for really low. Um, fees are are really really crucial uh, in terms of our own our own um, adoption of lightning network we uh, don't have it yet deployed actually we're uh, we're some I'd say a couple of months away from it but we'll be integrating it um, along with with other layer two solutions we'll be working side by side with with RSK for for that matter and so well it will be really really interesting and we'll do it always having in mind the best we can offer for the the user the everyday user that want to want to use bitcoin uh ideally for their everyday life i mean again from a, a ux perspective right i feel like making oh you know very making it very easy for users to like like here's my wallet here's how much value i have and being able to kind of spend and send that value without having to you know do a lot of switching and exchanging and all that stuff and have slippage um that's just so important especially when we start you know bringing in the dollar bringing in stable coins bringing in other assets right so uh you know i'm i'm very interested to see like how defiant in the ux um kind of is tackling this problem and i'm kind of curious uh 
you know, I guess I'll, 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 I'll go with that question first. Like, how are you kind of tackling, you know, managing balances, keeping it simple and easy for people to use? People may never have even used electric value or a brokerage account or investments or anything like that. Like, how is Defiant kind of treating that situation and making it accessible? Yeah, our view it's, it's quite, quite similar to yours as you described it. Um, like, we would like to, to, let's say, hide uh as much as we can from uh having different um the different balances of different coins and having to do swaps and managing slippages and always having to be really 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 aware of whether you're getting a correct amount of what you are for for what you're sending if you want to swap coins for instance so uh with that in mind one of the one of the our the things we, we moved on with is um, we're creating uh, in the same app a different um, different version of the app. Uh, you'll be able to use both of them and, uh, and switch uh, between them. So it will be called um, the defined single, and you will be and you'll be you'll be able to choose only one coin, one stable coin, probably. Uh, and that will be your your main coin, and you only see that that the balance of that coin, how much you you got, and you will have let's say less options, uh, but you'll be able to send and receive and also buy for for fiat and sell uh, for fiat that that same that very coin. That product we developed it with the the newcomer the newbie in mind and we think that we are really really uh, simplified and, and revamped um, the interface uh, the experience will be really easy for the, the user and they will have it denominated in, in us dollars because it will be a, um, a stable coin so that's that's one of the um, one of our strategies to solve what you were saying <laughs> Bitcoiners, let's take a break from the content and I want to tell you about Coolbix. Coolbix is an awesome Bitcoin hardware wallet that has been around for a really long time. They are building an amazing Bitcoin wallet called the Cool Wallet Pro. The Cool Wallet Pro is state of the art Bitcoin hardware wallet technology. Its form factor is like a credit card. You can put it into your wallet and it is designed to go with you on the go. So that way, even when you're on the go, you can have the benefit of a two-factor uh, hardware wallet design when you're trying to spend your Bitcoin. So you can have your Bitcoin uh, wallet uh, UX on your phone and make it really easy to scan, decide what you want to do. But then you sign with a cool X, which is in your back pocket. It is tamper-proof. It is waterproof. It is flexible. It has an awesome secure element in it. And it is a really awesome way in order to have some more flexibility, yet security when you're taking your Bitcoin on the go. I personally am a fan of, you know, this idea of making Bitcoin into a medium of exchange and making it into something that people use. I know it's going to take time, but they are working on the UX for making that possible in as secure a way possible. So uh, have some peace of mind. Check out the Cool Wallet Pro from Cool Bix. Uh, and yeah, thank you to them for sponsoring this podcast. Bitcoiners, I am so excited to tell you about the Bitcoin 2022 conference. You guys, Bitcoin 2021 was absolutely a smash hit success. It was over 13,000 Bitcoiners coming together, breaking the barriers on who can come together and celebrate freedom, celebrate Bitcoin. And the energy was absolutely electric. Unfortunately, it was just oversubscribed. There's just people flowing out everywhere. And this year we are learning, we are making the conference bigger and better. We are moving over to the Miami Beach Convention Center, and we are going to be throwing a massive four-day festival for Bitcoin, celebrating Bitcoin, bringing together the greatest minds in Bitcoin and the greatest businesses in Bitcoin. And lastly, the culture of Bitcoin all together. We have a four-day extravaganza planned for you guys for Bitcoin 2022. Uh, day one is going to be industry day. It is a day where you can buy a special ticket in order to uh, just mingle and make business deals happen. Day two and three is going to be a full-blown Bitcoin conference. This is our main conference. This is going to be on April 7th and 8th. 
And then lastly, we have the Sound Music Festival Day 4. Imagine going to Coachella, but for Bitcoin. There's going to be very few talks. It's going to be all about the culture of Bitcoin. It's going to be all about hanging with your fellow plebs. It is going to be an absolutely amazing time. There's going to be Bitcoin musicians, Bitcoin artists, and all your favorite Bitcoiners and just an amazing environment to party and just see it all, soak it all in, and to get people to realize that a Bitcoin world, a world filled with Bitcoin people doing Bitcoin things is the world that they want to live in. That's what Bitcoin 2022 is all about. That is what the Bitcoin conference is all about. That's what Bitcoin magazine is all about. So it is going to be a celebration of Bitcoin, the Bitcoiners, and this amazing movement that is going to make the world a better place. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Learn more about the Bitcoin conference. Learn more about all the amazing things that are happening in Miami around the Bitcoin conference and buy your tickets. And guess what? If you buy your bit tickets with Bitcoin, you save $100 on all the tickets and $1,000 on the whale pass. So if you want the VIP pass, the, the big kahuna, if you buy with Bitcoin, you save $1,000. That's a lot of stats. So go and do it right now today. Don't wait. Prices are only going up. This is going to be a can't miss event. <laughs> In, in El Salvador, we were seeing, uh, you know, McDonald's displaying prices and sats and things like that. And people like, you know, actually transacting in BTC. On the flip side, we're also seeing these massive lines of people who are just trying to take their BTC airdrop and withdraw into the USD cash. We're seeing people, um, you know, buying the airdrop for uh, $25. And so the $30 airdrop for $25 on the street things like that. So we're kind of seeing both what people want dollars and exposure dollars, but on the flip side, we're also seeing, you know, BTC native adoption. Diego, what's your assessment of like, um, and, and I know that you believe that stable coins are important, but like this dynamic, and do you think that like BTC denominated uh, pricing is something that is viable or do you think that USD is going to continue to dominate um, even in El Salvador where Bitcoin is legal tender? Yeah, I think I, I always tell uh, there's like two types of money if you want, if you want to. I mean, I mean, of course, it's a oversimplification, no? but conceptually, you have short term money. And what you want with short-term money is low volatility, and you can cope with some loss of purchasing power. And then you have medium to long-term money where you don't care about volatility, but what you want is to preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. So Bitcoin by design as not having any monetary, monetary policy that can be manipulated. It's like the monetary policy is already fixed. So you exactly know how many Bitcoins there will be at any time, point in time in the future. Um, necessarily is, is, you know, completely, I mean, the price of Bitcoin is completely defined by offer and demand. So, so, so the offer is fixed, and then the demand will fluctuate. Therefore, it will be volatile. It will be less volatile the more it's used, the more omnipresent it, it becomes, but it will always be volatile because it has nobody like manipulating the the supply, the money supply to, to make it stable on the short term. No? So it's like that that's the nature of how Bitcoin is designed or how money is designed. No? If you are scarce, the supply is fixed and demand is what determines the price, then you will be volatile. Um, so I, I think you know, Bitcoin will become less volatile, but until it becomes, you know, to a level of volatility that can be short-term money, it will take maybe decades. It's not something that is going to happen next year or the following year. And the best short-term money you have is, you know, the dollar, other stable assets. Um, you might think of better options. Like in the future, I was men I mentioned many times, like, one thing like Hayek and, and Keynes had in common is that both of them were proposing to create baskets of commodities as a way of money. The difference is like Keynes, of course, was like <laughs> proposing to do that in, with a centralized en entity 
like the IMF and uh, and control the that controls the index and everything. And Hayek was was proposing to do that in a free market where everybody was creating the round basket of commodities, and then the baskets of, of commodities were going to compete among them until you find the best basket of commodity. You know, so concept the implementation was different, but the concept behind it was the same. It's like how we create money that is connected to the real economy and then you we have like good money that is connected to the to the short term to the real economy development and so i think we will see thanks to to crypto we'll see the emergence of these new patterns for stable assets but for now the only thing that you have is the dollar the renminbi the pound the, the things that you know are manipulated by or controlled by governments that as we all know, have a political element to them, but also like try to create keep that short term stability, although they lose a lot of purchasing power over time. There has lost 95, 98% of the purchasing power in the last century. So that's the level of purchasing power loss that you get on a stable assets. But you know, it fulfills the, the role of pretty much, with the exception of the crisis maintains some productivity in the in the short term and that's why i think people will keep like using these uh these kinds of money to price things in the short term so so i, I mm -hmm. that's what i think it's like um uh, so that, that quick cross. what in terms of time i mean there's a couple of things that you said that I found really interesting. Like for me, I totally get why dollar denominated stable coins are popular and why people want that. You know, that makes complete sense to me, whether it's like a, a, a fiat backed one or whether it's something like money on chain and it's Bitcoin or ether backed. Um, but I've always been very skeptical of this idea that there's going to be a stable coin outside of something that's pegged to the dollar. Cause I don't know. I, I I just don't see how like that standard gets bootstrapped. I just feel like sats are going to be more competitive. So uh, I mean, I know that that's not necessarily about uh, Bitcoin adoption in South America, but uh, it is definitely something that maybe you two have an opinion on. Um, it sounds like you know, Diego, you think that uh, th there is such thing as like a, a stable value token that's not going to be the dollar that you know potentially could have a future. And you know, that's a pretty big statement to say that it won't happen, but. I don't know. I just don't. I just don't see it. But I, I think you know how you money is about trust. I mean, it's. it's I mean, I know we talk about fiat money because uh, the the backing of the dollar against the gold was removed in in 1971 by Nixon. But but the truth is like there's always trust. It's like certain level of trust. It, and and why some monies are like you know, better than others is because of the trust that people as a collective put in that money. It's like uh, you're, you're trusting I, either the, the issuer of the currency is like, you know, nobody understands how the Fed works or very little people understand that. But you have that level of trust that, you know, more or less they will behave with certain level of coherence, which actually they are not at the moment, no, because they are printing what, 30% of the monetary mass you know, in addition, so so, but conceptually, it's a, it's a matter of trust. It's like why people keep using certain monies or others. It's about trust. So for for sure, and and how trust was uh, uh, was created with the dollar by force. It's like after winning the the Second World War, then everybody got got together in in Bretton Woods, and the winner defined what was the the you know the the reserve currency for the world no it's like indeed Keynes was proposing a different thing he was proposing to use the bancor that was again what I was mentioning a commodity basket you know based on indexes managed by the IMF he was he was against the, the dollar as the because he knew the moment the, the dollar became the reserve currency of the world then the US would uh, not have a monetary policies in play I mean would not have the freedom to create to manage their monetary policies at, at will, no? so which ended up being what happens. Like they had to break the the gold backing because of that reason. So he was right conceptually, no. But why? And then how the dollar kept being enforced through force, 
you know, petrodollars, like the the general contracts around the the oil uh, contracts were forced to be in U.S. dollars. So again, it's like, and that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's like a, it's a reserve currency that is not not imposed by force. It's like if Bitcoin becomes the reserve currency of the world, is because the humankind choose to do so and because they trust the system they trust that that system will remain reliable and will you know keep the rules in place so that's why i also think like bitcoin is a non-violent revolution because it's like basically moving from for you know force based <laughs> uh money into you know mathematic and and economic and game theory based money so it's a reserve money so Conceptually, it's like, of course, it's like bootstrapping that is, is like a long process because you have to build trust and trust is built over time. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's like one thing is like, what will be the reserve currency of the world? And I think as Bitcoin demonstrates it's reliable and people can trust in it, it will become more and more the reserve world. And then regarding stable assets, as I said, is like, we need to build those at alternative stable assets that are not based on monetary policies and a central bank or, or the Fed, you know, maybe based on the commodities produced in a region. Maybe what we will have is a stable assets for each region instead of like one world stable asset. So we, we can say, okay, let's create stable assets based on the exports of Latin America. Let's create uh, stable assets based on the exports of Europe. You know? So we can create stable assets that are related to the local economy uh i don't know it's like uh of course this is like far-fetched but but i but i definitely think that these patterns will emerge how successful they are i don't know but currently we are in a crisis with the money because the china already broke you know the world uh the, the dollar as the reserve currency for the world because china created an economic circuit around the renminbi around the the yuan that is no longer uh, using the dollar. So they are creating trust, that level of trust that the dollar created thanks to the petrodollar contracts. They are creating that trust around the economic circuits in Asia that are ruled by the yuan. So, so I don't know. I, I, I think currency wars are already happening and that gives room to other stable assets to emerge. Uh, but we, we don't know what will happen. It's very uncertain. Sorry, I don't think I gave you an answer. I just put more I, questions. I, I, think, well, I think you you definitely hit on it at the end there. Um, so you definitely think that there's going to be more currency competition from countries as well, and that's going to open up the door. Um, you know, gentlemen, we're we're kind of hitting up on time, and I'm kind of curious, like you know, uh, a, a more zoomed out view, like um, Bruno, in, in terms of what you're seeing, you know. How far along is Bitcoin slash crypto slash RSK adoption, you know, in, uh, you know, the Spanish speaking world that you're operating in? And, um, you know, what's kind of like, do you, do you see this accelerating in the coming years? I'm kind of curious what the current status is, in your opinion. Yeah, completely. Um, we see that in particular, now that you bring it up, I think that some part, at least of the Spanish speaking world, has proved to have some particular features that make it more uh, uh, prone to the adoption of, of crypto, like for instance, Argentina, um, Venezuela, uh, and some countries in the Caribbean, as, as El Salvador, for instance, and some others. Um, I think that they will be the forefront of the, of the countries uh, in, in terms of adoption. And I only see it accelerating for sure. It will come and go for sure, as as, as you know, and uh, the price of the of the Bitcoin and other other uh, cryptocurrencies bring along um, some new waves of adoption because of the, how the media respond to those to those um, uh, rises in price and. But nevertheless, uh, regardless of the, of the variations in the price and the media, I think that there's we're seeing we're seeing a lot of people and really intelligent, talented people and teams coming to the space and bringing up their new ideas and their 
new products, um, more uh, close, closer to the technical part or closer to the, the usability part or to um, the educational part. So I think that it's just a matter of, of time. I think that what Diego was talking about uh, just now about the currency wars is something that is really, really related to it because uh, it's both the cause and also a consequence of this, of, uh, of the change in the paradigm as, as to what a, a currency is. Really, it's just a matter of, 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 um, of trust, as they all were saying, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that we're not too, too far away. I, I wouldn't really, I, I couldn't, of course, give you uh, numbers, but uh, this, this revolution came to, to stay and to change the way in which uh, most of the people do most of their lives in terms of communication, uh, work, um, every, every kind of economical activity or, and also leisure activities. And, and so, yeah, I think I really see that accelerating, you know. Right. I agree, and I see the ecosystem growing like more mature and, and integrating, uh, and that's key because I think it's about creating network effects. It's like Ethereum managed to create a lot of network effects for speculative purposes. No, it's like uh, it's like kind of um, if you look at the Ethereum ecosystem, it's mostly speculative and it's self-serve. No, it's an, an endogenous system. Because productive use cases cannot live in an environment where transaction costs are twenty dollars or thirty dollars, no. But and 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 I think that's the big opportunity of the RSK Bitcoin ecosystem to serve like the real use cases, the real. And also, it's important that and I think Bruno mentioned that is like they are like with Defiant. I think they are going in the right direction of being a multiple network system because as this ecosystem, I always talk about the Internet of Value. No, Bitcoin is at the foundations, in my opinion, of the Internet of Value. But then you will have multiple networks with different security models that can serve for different different purposes. And networks that, you know, are decentralized, like Tron, for example, today are being used to move USDT because the operational cost is low. And I, I know this is not long term because you know those blockchains are like giving like very cheap transaction tra transactional cost on chain at the expense of the future of the network so these networks won't be here two three five years from now so they are like you know transitional networks but enable the networks that are building like rsk and bitcoin itself that is very like slow to grow in terms of scalability, slow to make changes, but it allows the networks that are being prepared for the decades to come to incorporate the technologies that will enable the scalability to be sustainable. And, and I think that's what we have today. We have like blockchains that are saying, OK, we don't care. Let's do 3,000 transactions per second or 10,000 transactions per per second, even if we will blow a year from now or two years from now, because the important thing is like to just to gather as much activity as possible. And those are being used and they provide like, uh, as I said, like a, a bridge to the future. Uh, and you have cases like Solana's that, you know, they had to reset the blockchain, like they had to sit down and say, OK, guys, <laughs> this didn't work. So let's re rewind and reboot. and. And that's the level of centralization of those networks. But in the short term, nobody cares. But in the long term, we will care. Because once you have $2 trillion, $10 trillion in the network, you don't want somebody to be able to rewind and reboot. So, so we have that, like, you know, that, that thing that is a mixed reality where you have networks that are like compromising their future, but gathering all the attention and the economic activity today, and networks that are growing and evolving into something that will last and will be here for the decades to come. And, you know, both are part of this, is that both are necessary. So the same thing as like productive use cases are necessary as much as speculative use cases, because speculative use cases, like the speculation in Ethereum creates a lot of liquidity. So it's useful as well. It's not a matter of either or. And that's why, well, Rootstock, comes from a philosophical perspective from the lesson and basically what they say is like this 
multiplicity of things is what creates society. And I think the same applies to crypto economies. It's like you have some foundational elements that are growing slow, but they are setting foundations that will be sustainable and, and choosing scalability path that will be sustainable. And then you have others that are more on the short term focus, like trying to gather as much attention and economic activity they can, even if they don't care about the future. And both are contributing to the decentralization movement. And that's important yeah. thing. It's like everything we are doing is taking us closer to a sovereign world where people will be in control of their data and their and their value. And that's the only thing that matters, no? It's like, and we are all doing different contributions for that to happen. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you just very well articulated an opinion that I've been kind of like stirring in my head around, you know, where all this fits. So uh, I think I tend to agree with you for the most part, uh, especially around how all this fits with Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the short term uh, utility of some of these networks uh, and how that long term is good for Bitcoin and helps people kind of onboard into crypto UX, onboard into all this other stuff. So I'm definitely going to steal several of those ideas and, and re-listen to that portion <laughs> of the podcast. Um, but gentlemen, this they are was a open, great, open, yeah. you know, they are open source ideas, so you can yes. take them. You don't need to steal them. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I'm going to be taking them. But um, it was great chatting with both of you all. Um, I want to give you each a last uh, moment to just, you know, give a last word. Uh, let's go to uh, to Bruno. Why don't you start? And then we can close it out with Diego. But, you know, uh, just a final word to the Bitcoin Magazine audience. Well, just uh, it's a pleasure to, to have been here. Um, hope it's not the last because we're one of the, the projects that, as Diego distinguished, uh there's two kind of, of projects the ones that one uh, some that are in the, in the scene for the short term and uh, others that are for the long term and uh, looking into uh, building products and really understanding the scene and being here because we know that we are building the, the foundations of new new societies to come so pleasure to to be here and uh, hoping for the the next one Bruno, where can people uh, find you on the internet, especially Twitter, if you're on there? Twitter, yeah, you can find, uh, well, uh, Defiant is Defiant app. And from there, we've got two accounts, one in Spanish, one in English. Uh, right now, from one, you can go to the other one. Uh, me, myself, I'm, well, from there, you, you, can, you can see uh, tweets by, my, by me and you can go there. We also have, also, also, our website is defiantapp.tech, T-C-H, and from there you can go to, you can, you have the, 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 the download links and links to our social networks and whatever. Awesome. Awesome. And defiant app dot tech. go to that. I'll put all yeah. the handles inside the show notes. Uh, Diego, what's your last word? Well, I... Uh, I think it's like, uh, you know, I haven't had this feeling um, since I started with Bitcoin in 2012, 2013, where we had that feeling that we were like really making an end and, and making something meaningful for society. And and now I, I said many times that 2021 is the year where mainstream adoptions kickstarts in the crypto and the Bitcoin world. And uh, that feeling is only get, getting stronger. I think it's like, uh, I'm very happy because after so many years of like trying to put together many things and to create an ecosystem around Bitcoin, to scale it, to extend it, to, to turn it in, into the financial system of the future, I think we are getting there. Like, and it's not only RSK, it's also Lightning, you know, um, all, all Liquid from Blockstream, all, all the models that are working around that. Are, are creating this, plus all the partners like the wallets, like DeFi and the DeFi protocol. So, so finally, I think we are, we are like getting back to the original spirit we had in the first meetups where people was like downloading a, you know, Bitcoin wallet back then we were sending like a few dollars, the transaction cost were, was very low back then. So we are going back to a circle 
But now with so much, so many tools in our toolkit that were not available back then. Back then it was only Bitcoin, and now we have all these amazing uh, tools at our disposal, and we are getting like big exposure in the media I and mean, the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole is getting big exposure. So I think this will be a second, you know, cycle of adoption for Bitcoin, and uh, but it, it will be, you know. It, a new Bitcoin, a Bitcoin that is extended, reloaded, and, <laughs> and I think it's, I'm very excited. I think next years will be amazing years for the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. So, yeah, no, I mean, I think that you're you're totally right there. You know, if Bitcoin happened in El Salvador ten years ago, it would have been fallen flat on its face and been a terrible experience. But now. You know, I think despite the El Salvadorian government, Bitcoin is ready, you know, for that, right? You know, people were, who Absolutely. used Bitcoin wallets were able to actually use them, um, whereas the government wallet, which, which was the one that was failing. Um, so I totally agree. Diego, where can people find out more about you, uh, V-Labs, RSK, uh, all the stuff that you're doing? I mean, my, my nickname on Twitter is Dieguito, like little Diego in Spanish is D I E. G U I E I T O, um, and then the RSK uh, handle is RSK Smart. So, so both of them are good. If you want to listen to my ramblings, <laughs> you go to at Dieguito in Twitter. Otherwise, you can go to RSK and Smart and, and see 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 more more technical stuff and and the developments of the ecosystem as a whole. Awesome. Well, you know, RSK and IOV Labs and your team, they're hustling all the time for Bitcoin, you know, even deep in the bear market. And that's when I got the pleasure of, uh, you know, meeting, <laughs> meeting your team. So um, it, it's been awesome to, uh, to get to know you as well. I encourage all the listeners to follow both of these gentlemen, continue following what is happening across the entire Bitcoin ecosystem. And the best place for that is Bitcoin Magazine, bitcoinmagazine.com. So check that out. Follow me at CK underscore Snarks on Twitter too. Give us those five-star reviews. Go check out all the things we're doing, including the Bitcoin conference. So until then, peace. Peace.